as we think about the make or buy decision, let's walk through an example of Coors that makes a beer that many of you would, would know or have heard commercials on, Coors Light or Coors, the banquet beer. A key ingredient in Coors is malt barley. So literally, the type of malt barley variety used in making manufacturing beer has direct relationship with the, the um, foam content that you see on a particular type of beer. And we'll talk about this in the context of Coors. And let's think about the make or buy decision. Coors, for a long time, chose to make almost everything in the production of their beer. The Coors family made investment in a number of things. Malt barley breeding programs, grain elevators, water, aluminum cans, trucking, and other assets just to control the supply chain to give their product a differentiation in the marketplace. If you're a consumer, of course, for those of you that are legally able to drink, only you can judge whether or not all those investments actually give you a better tasting beer. But Coors is trying to convince you that it does through all these different investments, which is different than what Budweiser does or Budweiser Light or other types of firms. So going back to our, our diagram there, Coors, in contrast to many other beer manufacturers, has chosen to make things. Now, I'm not talking about microbrews. These microbrews, in fact, are doing the same type thing. But I'm talking about the broad, almost generic type beers. Miller, Budweiser, um, Grain Belt, all of those type things that you may see or have heard about. Those firms tend to be more of a, in this part of the chain, Coors was always the exception of trying to own almost everything when they manufacture their beers. And the case study that I've got that you've been reading about, we'll talk more a bit about this. Again, I'm not going to go through this diagram, but you can trace through how Coors decided they wanted to own all these assets and build the supply chain to build out its beer. Um, so again, Coors is selling a beer here, and it's coordinating as much of this as it possibly can. For a long time, it almost owned all of that. Now it's moving more and more contractual arrangements, but it is, it is very tightly controlled versus the other types of beer companies. And what they did was then, they basically had a hierarchical type view of their malt barley, um, which is the example we're going to look at today. So we think about the manufacturing of beer. There's a number of things we need. Water, hops, cereal grains, um, malting barley. We need packaging materials. And as I mentioned, Coors for a long time was 100% vertically integrated in all these. To the point where they owned 60 springs near Golden, Colorado that enable it to have pure Rocky Mountain spring water. Now if you look very close, closely when they built, in the early 1980s, they built a second beer brewery in Winchester, Virginia. They stopped using the pure Rocky Mountain Spring Water logo because some of their beer was now being produced east of the Mississippi and near the Appalachian Mar Mar uh, Mountains. One of the criteria when they built that factory in Winchester, and they also bought uh, property in Memphis, was that the water, the mineral properties of the water, had to be identical to what they had near Golden, Colorado. So when they moved east of the Mississippi in the early 1980s, they wanted to have pure water, pure spring water, very close or almost identical to what they were using from the Rocky Mountains. They also built their own malt barley equipment for a long time. And what we're going to talk about today is their malt breeding program and what they did with that to give their own malt barley varieties relative to their competition. So let's think about their supply chain activities. The case talks about these, everything from steeping in barley for four to six days, what they do with the malt, how they convert what's left that malt in mixing with hot water and filtering to create the sugary liquid, which is called wort, how they take that wort, mix it with hops, put it in copper kettles, what they do with that then to age or condition the beer, and finally uh, packaging the beer at a constant cold temperature. Coors brags that their temperature, their beer is always held at a constant temperature to the point that the trucks that ship their beer ship the beer in those refrigerated containers. That's not the way other companies do their beer. So another part of their segregation is the segregated supply chain, this vertically coordinated chain is we're going to ship our beer at a constant temperature. 
Um, Coors was the first to use the freshness code on their beer cans. They also used for a long time dark amber bottles to, to guard against light damage when they had things in glass bottles. It's not an issue in cans, but they used dark bottles to guard against light damage. Um, and so the service part of this, they had their salespeople actually having the drivers check on the freshness codes when they delivered beer. So a lot of these things you don't see as a consumer, for those of you that consume beer, but Coors did a lot of things to really try to convince consumers their product was different because they had a segregated supply chain, they were a chain captain, they were integrating that supply chain in this way. Um, in the make or buy decision uh, module, we talked real quickly about agency theory. In this case, Coors is the principal agent. I'm sorry, the, the, the Coors is called the principal and the barley grower, the farmer, is called the agent. So as we think about this, Coors wants a certain type of barley production. The quality has to be a certain type because they want low amounts of um, uh, foam in their beer. And they also want the beer to, have do, to hold up well in a refrigerated type supply chain. What they did was Coors decided we have to own our own malt barley varieties. We're not going to use the the malt barley varieties developed by Montana State University or the Idaho Ex Agricultural Experiment Station or Utah State or any place else, they said we're going to have our own malt barley varieties that no one else can have. We believe these malt barley varieties are so unique that are so part of our beer system that we're not going to let anybody else produce these and give away this malt barley to Anheuser-Busch or someone else. And so these transaction costs are an important way of understanding why Coors does, did what it did. Malt barley quality is very variable from year to year. So weather, humidity, rain, too much rain, lack of rain, really depends on changes its, its, its uh, quality. And so it really doesn't know what the quality is until the malt barley is actually harvested and delivered to their facilities. They need malt barley every year. They can't store this for, for years. It's only good for a certain amount of time. And Coors says we want our certain type of varieties. And in fact, we're going to own our own receiving stations or grain elevators for producers to deliver that malt barley. So this is a relationship specific asset. The malt barley variety, the grain elevator, and the contracts they're signing with growers. In fact, what you find is many of these growers have been 50 or 60 year producers of malt barley for Coors. So as part of the farmer's production system, they've been signing this contract with Coors for many decades, two or three generations in the case of some families, um, on these, um, these particular type of varieties. So the case talks about the types of different, uh, the ratio of feed barley to malt barley and why that's important. I'm not going to talk about that. You can read about that. But what you're going to see is, the time this case was written in the mid-2000s, the variability was beginning to change. It was increasing over time. And that was a problem for Coors. Um, the quality is important. I talked a bit about those. Um, quality tests are needed in terms of looking at the malt barley. Um, and the, so what Coors chose to do, the vertical boundaries of the Coors was, we're going to do all this stuff at Golden, Colorado. So up until the early 1980s, all of the Coors beer was grown, was produced in Golden, Colorado. In fact, growing up as a kid, when, you know, I remember people around me, relatives and so forth, that they knew of someone that was going out through Colorado, they would say, can you stop and buy us a six pack or a case of Coors beer? You couldn't buy that beer in Minnesota. It was impossible. There just wasn't enough supply. It was all produced for the most part in, in the western part of the United States. Um, Coors said, because we're only producing things in Golden, Colorado, we're going to control everything. They were the first beer company to use an aluminum can. They built, they bought an aluminum factory and a source of aluminum to make those cans. They were doing all these things at the Golden, Colorado factory um, to do the, to make this beer. So, 
what about the price part about this? So for a long time, until Coors built their new factories in Winchester, Virginia, Coors beer up until the mid-1980s had a premium. Oftentimes it's 25 cents a can more than a can, than a can of um, Miller or something else. So over time, however, that price differential went away. So typically Coors today is probably more or less the same as its competition, like Bud Light or the other things. Coors, though, has, has developed cost advantages by going to all 50 states now with the new factory and taking these efficiencies and trying to do a better job persuading consumers that they have a differentiated product. Only you can be the judge of that, but it's a good way of looking how Coors is one of the first people in the food system to really try to build a segregated supply chain as a chain captain around this production of Coors, the banquet beer, and Coors, Coors Light.